welcome everybody, no matter where you are today. Between Charles Hoskinson and Harumi, the record is now on three appearances at the Tokyo FinTech Meetup. Harumi started her career as the first woman on the fixed income desk at Morgan Stanley here in Japan and was the first topic we talked about on a panel on diversity and inclusion. She's doing some initiatives outside of finance and doing a startup on space data, so it's called Celestial Data. That was our meetup almost a year ago. And normally it would be the time now for you to return and see your family again. And given the environment, we decided to do this virtually, which is great. It gives a few more people the opportunity to attend to learn in the first place what Celsius is. And secondly, have maybe a more general discussion about DeFi, decentralized finance versus centralized finance versus legacy banking, etc. So that's enough for me. Thanks. Mr. Rumi, it's great to see you again. Take it away, please. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for tuning in to hear a few things that we are doing at Celsius Network. A few years ago, when the blockchain really became a thing that everybody began to talk about, the founders of Celsius also got on that wave, started the company. Actually, it's one of the very, very few companies, I think, that raised ICO, that raised the first capital through ICO, and then it's still alive and actually living with a solid business model. I think there's a lot to be said about that. So what is really Celsius Network? Our mission is to put interest income and economic freedom in the hands of the people by taking it away from the banks. So, I mean, we all have a bank account somewhere. I do too. And how much interest do you earn on your hard-earned US dollar or JPY or whatever the currency that you earn? Less than 1% nowadays, right? Celsius, depending on which currency you have, whether you have Bitcoins, Ether, uh, stable coins, percentage varies because the rewards that we pay on each coin really depends on our needs, where the market is for each currency. Just like if you have multiple currencies around the world, each currency earns a slightly different interest. But I guarantee you, it's not less than 1%. The lowest one that you will find is somewhere around 5%, and it goes all the way up to 15, 16%, depending on what currency you have. And what kind of combination you have. So we are trying to provide a economic freedom by earning hard on your hard earned dollar. The problems that we are solving, we are trying to basically provide as much return on your money as possible. That is really the bottom line. But when you have cryptocurrency, what are some of the problems you face? You don't go to bank, deposit bitcoins and say, oh, please give me an interest on that. So there's really no obvious way to earn interest on your currencies. And if you want to borrow against your cryptocurrency position, it's very hard to get loans because it's still not considered as the real assets by many financial institutions. And there are very limited number of tools out there for you to do the investing, thinking about how to manage your portfolio, however that comes, and also buying and owning crypto is difficult. How many of you really have wallets? So we know that it's more difficult. You can just go to the website and then find any financial institution, hit the button. You have to do a little bit of homework first. We're solving all these problems by acting as the centralized finance amongst the decentralized finance industry. That's what I always say. We are the CFI of DeFi. This company started really mobile app first. We are currently developing a web app as well. So it is going to change just a few months down the line. But right now we are the mobile app company and all the stats that you're going to see, they were the numbers that we took as of June and things really, really have been going up and up since then. So the numbers are really outdated, although it's only four months ago. For example, our fund size is a little over 600 million. Now we actually have a billion and six. So in the short four months, things changed a lot for us. But as of June, we had 123,000 users and uh, we had 250,000 plus downloads of the applications. 80% is really coming from word of mouth, very organic things. We don't do a big sort of marketing or advertisement, buying an expensive advertisement space or something like that. User growth and retention, as I mentioned, we grow really fast. And from the middle of last year, it's been, you've been already seeing this curve and it's only accelerating faster. So over the last year, the app downloads increased by 230% and over 85% of the people actually completed the KYC, know your customers. 
meaning they did all the paperwork and all that stuff, and they actually are using the application in one way or another. Money over IP business model. So how do we generate income? Okay, fine. I give you my Bitcoins and then somehow I get the payout every week. How do you make money so that I can receive the rewards on my Bitcoins and then other coins? It's because we are doing something with your coins. Once you transfer your coins to our wallet, we do make a lot of loans to both retail and institutional clients. So we actually have B2C and B2B aspect to our business model. Basically, the retail customers mainly use telephone apps, deposit the coins to us, and sometimes they borrow money using their own coins as collateral. And what we do is we go find the US dollars or the USDT, USDC, the stable coins, and then we lend those monies against the collateral coin, and then we collect the interest on that. That's one way of us making money. With the institutions, we are far more leveraged because we don't only have to do the stable coin or the fiat business. We can do coin to coin. Sometimes it goes reverse. We have a lot of different ways to make money. And then with all the lending platforms and now with DeFi on, on the horizon, there are several different ways that we are making money as well. And whatever we make, unlike regular companies, which first pay all the expenses and distribute the money amongst all the shareholders and everybody else, and the rest goes to, let's say, if it's a financial institution, the customer's money, we actually from the revenue that we get, we pay up to 80% out as the rewards on all of the coins that people deposit with us. And with the leftover money, if you will, we actually pay all other expenses. So that makes the return ratio hugely different from the regular financial institutions. This is the team. We have about 65 people now. And this is not accounting some of the outsourced team and stuff like that. Alex Mashinsky, if you have been following some of the entrepreneur scene or even just blockchain scene, you probably have come across his name. He is speaking all over the world. Half the people that I speak to have heard of Alex. This is his ace entrepreneurship road that he's taking. He has multiple public companies and the areas where he was active, where he started his company, only the probably common string is that they are all involved technologies and otherwise they are all very different. And he's intending to make this one yet another success. He has every intention and we are trying to make that happen. Daniel and Nuke, those are the co-founders of the company and collectively they are the CEO, COO and president and CTO. Myself, I'm the CFO. I also have the function of CIO, so I have both accounting and the trading that's under my department. And then we have the business development, we have the lending department, and then we have the general counsel. And the team is really expanding fast. From the end of July to August, we added probably 15 people or so on the payroll. And this month, uh, yet again, we are going to add another 10 people or so. We, uh, with the Series A just finished, completed we are expanding really, really fast. Through Series A, we raised a little bit over $20 million, which is a pretty big amount of money for Series A. And we were evaluated the largest of the same stage company, the crypto industry. So we are quite happy about the outcome of this one. As I said earlier, we pay up to 80% of how much we make before we start deducting any expenses. So the reward payout with the interest, it, it's actually growing really, really fast as well. Every week, since we pay out every week, we can keep track of how much we're paying weekly. And as the person who looks after the accounting department as well, every week I see that number, I go like this. <laughs> This is another way of seeing how quickly we're growing. It's not just the payout, but the people who come through KYC, people who are actively transferring the coins into our wallet. People can actually choose to earn their interest either in kind. So if you have Bitcoins with us, you can choose to earn the interest with Bitcoins, or you can choose to take the payout with our token called CEL, C-E-L and up to 30% bonus payout on your hard-earned money. The concentration of Celsius users go with kind of internet coverage, and it's no coincidence because in order to have wallets, in order for you to have these digital currencies, you need a reasonable internet coverage, right? So the stronger internet we have, the more users we have. 
This is what Alex Mashinsky, our CEO, likes to call the business model or the flywheel of Celsius. I mean, you kind of got the gist of what we do with the business. We take the transfers from the client, we make money on them, we pay out, we develop the relationship with both retail and then institutions. To sell our token takes a very, very big part of this flywheel because if you choose to earn in sales, you can earn more. And if you choose to pay your interest using sales, you can actually choose to pay less amount of money than if you're paying in kind, which really encourages people to keep what we call HODL ratio. It's the amount of sales that you have against all other cryptocurrencies that you have. And the more sales that you have in your wallet, the more sales become necessary, right? As part of your beings and actually the sell token, the value has risen over 2000% in the last one year. So if you have certain ratio, five to 10% of sales, if you're silver level with the sell, the sell hodl ratio, you earn five to 10% more. If you are the gold, you earn 10 to 20% more. And if you have platinum, then you earn more than 20%. So that's really our flywheel looking to sell. I think it's something, if you are into a cryptocurrency, it's definitely one of the tokens out there that are relatively hot right now about Lime. This partnership just mm-hmm. opened a few weeks ago. At least some of you are from Japan, you know what the company is. But for those of you who have not heard of Line or who are not quite sure of what our partnership with them is, actually because Japan is a very heavily regulated country when it comes to blockchain cryptocurrency business, we can't just drop a person in Japan and start an office there to start taking the coin transfer from the people in Japan. So we formed a partnership with Line, which is one of Asia's largest tech conglomerates with 84 million users of their messaging platform alone to utilize their customer base and the legal existence in Japan to start opening up the business. In just one week after we officially opened, we already have 6 million worth coins coming from this partnership. So we are very excited about this partnership and that we want to assure you know, everyone that we are taking every steps, every measures we can take to make sure that we are going to stay legal so that we can continue to pay out the high ratio on your hard earned money that you trust us with. The first question that came from India and was asking how many users do you have in India, but maybe you can answer a bit more broadly in terms of overall regional distribution. The regional distribution, right now it's like you know, 30 to 40% US or North America, another 30 to 40% overall sort of uh, Europe, mainly Western Europe, and the rest spread out throughout the rest of the world. We do have our office presence in the US, the main office being in New Jersey, since New York is probably some of you know, um, it's a little bit more difficult place to operate as a crypto company. So that our head, our U.S. headquarter office is in New Jersey, Hoboken. We are a U.K. company because of a lot of different types of regulations that we have to deal with. So although we are a Delaware company, our headquarter office is in London, U.K. And we also have a big presence in Tel Aviv, Israel because of where our founders come from. So out of these offices, those are only the offices, the physical offices that we have, yet we have our customers because this is very much digital business. You can be anywhere, you can be on the moon for that matter to operate this business and you can still serve everyone around the world. So we actually do have 30, 40% coming from all over the world. You're registered in the U.S. in New Jersey, so just across the river, basically. But that also means you don't have a crypto license from the New York Department of Financial Services. Does that then mean you essentially can't do transactions with New York State residents? We can. We just are not able to hold the customer assets outside the wallet, which is not able to operate in New York. So we actually have a separate custody business with the entity that can take the New York coins, a New York residence coins, I should say. Understood. The model that you've implemented with Line, as long as you're dealing with a counterparty that also has a U.S. entity, 
Bitflyer, for example, is an obvious example. They have a U.S. entity and a European entity could essentially implement a similar structure with them as well, right? Absolutely. So we no longer have the partnership in place because the regulations are even more difficult in Germany, but that we did have a similar relationship with Bitwala. They were sort of like a white labeling, you know, our solution to do something similar. So yeah, we can actually definitely have this kind of partnership formed all around the world. It's more about, because we're still small company, I mean, we're growing really fast, but you saw it, we have 65 people. If we end up having 100 different partnerships, it's very difficult to manage. So we have to be very strategic as to like, you know, who we work with. Definitely some, you know, exciting institutions that are now approaching us. It used to be just a year ago, right? We were approaching, we, we were outreaching to them, but now we are hearing the other side, you know, saying you want to work with us. So we're very excited about that. The line business is one side of our equation, right? To take the coins in and then, but we do need the other side of the business too, to make this holistic, which is we have to be able to find a partner where we can do the lending through. So in order for us to make money, right? So right now we take the coins and we will deploy wherever we can. So it doesn't have to be like, you know, it doesn't have to be said deployed to the Japanese market. But if we can also do the other side, right? Um, people can take the loans against their own collateral instead of us always finding every single use case for all these coins coming from Japan. That is like a holy grail for us. So if you can think of someone, I'm all ears. <laughs> if you look at it from a product perspective, 200% over collateralization is maybe not that, that bad, although we, we can talk about the risk side as well, but it's also not tremendously efficient. So are you looking at ways to make it more efficient? So it's maybe only whatever, 50% more, 20% more, and, and you, what's the, the product roadmap further out from here? If you're talking about the collateralization, the 200% collateralization is obviously like with retail and who are using their own coins to borrow money from us, right? On the flip side, on the B2B side, it's not a reasonable business model from any angle. So what we do instead is to conduct obviously an additional due diligence on top of regular KYC that the retail, the regular retail clients go through. So of course, the KYC is granted before any institutions can be onboarded. But if they do request a credit line for that matter, for I have a risk management office also. Like an I, earlier I said I have the accounting and then I have the trading, but I also have risk management department and the CFO as well. And they conduct a very thorough due diligence on the company, look at the financials, look at the profile of the traders, look at the profile of the company. And then we grant 2 million, 5 million, whatever it might be, we, we grant uh, the credit line. So there are two slightly separate things going on, depending on if you're talking about retail or if you're talking about large institutions. Even with that safety margin and the risk metrics in place, we did have the Black Thursday in March and the price is more than halved. At the time, Maker, of course, got into a bit of trouble and now we got the class action lawsuit pending there. And I remember that Alex was tweeting at the time that was actually one of the best days in Celsius histories because a, the, the system was robust enough, it didn't break down, it didn't have any issues. It was obviously an environment where the, the interest rates went through the roof, so both Celsius and the participants on the platform had a record earnings day. What did the organization learn from such an extreme price movement? So, I mean, Alex is absolutely right. It was actually one of the best days that we have had. A lot of you probably have done some kind of trading. So you know that the trading game, although we don't want to make it that way, somebody's gain, somebody's loss, somebody's loss is somebody's gain, right? So we actually happen to be on the right side of that market. Uh, I mean, we clearly saw what was going on. So we were able to take advantage of that. And then if you remember what I said, we actually pay up to 80% of what we make. The advantage that we find in the market is actually advantage for our clients. And yes, we did have robust enough systems so that there was some like you know, panic withdrawal, right? Just like anything. 
any trading related institution that you can think of, there was some kind of withdrawal uh, on that day, but everybody was able to, including really large withdrawal, were able to complete the withdrawal within the time frame that has been allotted for any kind of you know, large amount. So the system held, our trading business did very well. We met all our margin calls that we were called and all our clients met the margin calls. And only the people who chose to liquidate the position because they didn't want to submit additional in a margin, they voluntarily liquidated. So there was no like forced liquidation like many other exchanges and in other places that just kind of forced the meltdown to happen. As Celsius, obviously that was a really busy day. That was one month after I joined Celsius as a CFO and CIO. And I had a much smaller team back then. And I was going like this every five minutes. Oh my gosh, where am I going to find all these coins as the margin calls are coming in? But somehow we managed to meet all of them. My staff did a really excellent job. I have been in finance and I have done some trading. And I would say this was definitely the most volatile days I personally have experienced. Somehow we made it through the day and somehow because I knew that the, you know, my staff were doing a good job, even when other executives, other parts of the company were beginning to be concerned if we can meet all the things that were happening, I was able to say, because I was able to trust my you know, staff, I said, you know, not to worry, we are meeting all the money, we will find them, don't worry, just go, you know, go conduct the business as business as usual. Nothing bad will happen to us. And really nothing bad happened to us. Indeed, something really good happened to us. So um, I think that was our March 12th experience. And I think for a while, the crypto industry, together with also Corona lockdown, you know, happening at the same time, it went very briefly, very quiet. But immediately after that, it just came back with a roar. Our sign up on the weekly basis went the record number, record number, record number. So I think that indeed, I think, you know, a lot of people out there realized like, you know, sort of like, you know, saw the difference, right? Who, who can really help us? Who cannot help us? I think that really kind of gave us the, the wind behind the sail. Last risk-related question, but the other risk that everybody is conscious of is, of course, the risk of, of hacking, cybersecurity issues, etc. And clearly, with an Israeli background in the company as well, one would assume that you're well positioned there. But how do you view the cybersecurity threat landscape at the moment? Yes, so in the landscape, generally speaking, it's real, and everybody seems to be taking a turn to get hacked. We do have a very strong security department. We have a CSO, the chief security officer, who has an experience of working both on the dark web side and then on the sort of like, you know, the white side, for lack of better words, bringing all that experience into how to conduct Celsius business. And he's really tightened up the operations from the day he joined. So we already had a fairly good security system prior to that. But since then, you know, it's almost like, right, and for us who have to do the day-to-day -day business thing, it's almost like, oh my God, no more security talk, no more security this, no more security that. But he's obviously like, you know, pounding us with it. He's like uh, testing us. He's sending the test emails. A lot of people, you know, sort of like uh, uh, tripped over those things first. But now because they got trained so well, if some email comes that is legitimate, we're still asking questions, should we, op should we actually open this email? But that's the kind of mentality we need in order to run the business of this nature, right? So um, I think both financial security and cyber security, I think we have a very good team working at Celsius that keep us safe on any given day so that I can do my job. I wanted to ask you about Alex as a person because he's got a very interesting profile. Some people react very positively to it and somebody uh, he might rub a bit the wrong way, which is fine, I think. No, no issue with that. But he posted a few weeks ago a Harvard Business School case study, which I think was on his earlier companies, maybe even his first, which was like a telecoms venture in the 90s. And the study was written in 2001, I think. So it's a little older. What can you tell us about him as a person, as a character? Obviously, I don't get intimidated too easily, but the very first time I sat down with him, I'm like, what did I get myself into, right? I and mean, how did I get here? An investment banker, very traditional investment banker girl <laughs> who started in Tokyo, 
how did I get here? That's how I felt at the beginning. Yes, I mean, just like any strong leader, there are times when he states very strong opinion and then that does like, you know, sort of create that bipolar persona that you described at the beginning of this question. When you actually sit down and talk to him, he's very reasonable. I think that's, that's a key. You can be a little bit eccentric. Sometimes like you have to be a really kind of like strong standout personality in order to drive 10, sometimes like thousands of people, right, to success and have multiple IPOs in your past. You really have to have that kind of personality. But when you sit down and talk to him and then when you really listen to him, you actually hear that things that he says most of the time make sense. And that's, I think, important because business, no matter what kind of business you run, you need to have some common sense. And you need to have some business logic in order to be successful. If like somebody like Edison from the past is reborn into the present world and tries to run a company, he's probably not going to be too successful because he's a little bit too out there. So you really need a person who can actually try to take the whole sort of company a little bit out there so that you are bringing some innovation to this world. But at the same time, you know, you have to be able to fit that into the real world. And for that, you need a real person. I would say Alex definitely brings in that kind of quality to company. Yeah, that's valuable. I was going out to the edge, looking over, getting scared at times and backing off, but at least pushing the envelope and, and yeah. trying to move forward. Wonderful. Thank you very much again for getting up this early. It was fantastic to see you again. Good rest of the year. And then hopefully we get to see each other in person again in 2021. Absolutely. We've got to really make this an annual, like minimum annual things. So I'm looking forward to next October, November. Thank, Thank you. you. Talk later.